Hello, this is the video lecture for Chapter 10, Voting Campaigns and Elections. It's the last chapter in Module 2. We have our 10 study guide questions that I'll refer to during the lecture, and there is no essay for this particular one. Here's a picture of our new president, considered an upset because many people didn't factor in the social anxiety factor uh, about the economy and international affairs in the election. So we'll first look at the different models of election, three of them. And the first is the prospective or responsible party voting model. And we have question number 56, what is the prospective voting model? And this is where voters make a decision based on what government will do in the future. So prospective, will do in the future. So it needs parties to be cohesive and the voters must see and take a stand, understand what the stands of the two parties are. And then the winning party has to do what they say. So this can create heated conflict between parties as it often does in Europe uh, and possibly even gridlock but most people consider this the, the better of the three models. The second model is the electoral competition model, which is that parties uh, simply try to say whatever is possible to get a candidate elected. And this appeals more to the median voter. And uh, it, it again assumes the parties are unified and it, it assumes the parties are seeking votes to get elected, not necessarily to carry out an ideology. So as you can see by this curve, both liberal and conservatives, once they get nominated, rush to the middle to get that median voter to vote for them. Now, in power, they'll do uh, what they think needs to get done, but it's all based upon you know, public opinion and where people are. The retrospective, the third of the model, is the reward or punish voting model. model. People consider this maybe the worst of the three, and it gets rid of bad leaders, but that's because bad leaders have already done bad things, right? You want to put people in um, th to do the things you want. So ultimately, uh, th this is one that kind of looks to fix a problem more than anything else. So we have uh, what's called... Uh, all three exist today. We call it the imperfect electoral democracy. None of these models work perfectly anyway, but occasionally all of them do come together. It says here, 1932 election of Franklin Roosevelt. I would say the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan is probably another good example of these models working together. So uh, we cannot ensure democracy unless all citizens vote. And we're going to talk a little bit about people going to the polls and making sure uh, more people vote and why it seems to be so difficult in America. So part of it is just the unique nature of American elections. We have numerous and frequent elections across all levels, federal, state, and local. Election procedures and vote counting are very inconsistent and first past the post. And we'll talk about all three of those. So we are election happy. We elect nearly 500,000 positions and people often have ballot fatigue. That is, especially from issues and referendums. It's not unusual for me to go to the ballot box and have uh, 30 or 40 choices involved. So states are in charge of elections, and that is uh, part of the reason for the inconsistency. So the federal government has stepped in from time to time. Uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which is really uh, African Americans, finally got the, the right to vote in a way that was enforceable. And then a 19 or 2002 law regarding provisional ballots. So if you move recently, you can go to the poll and vote provisionally, and then they can uh, count your vote afterwards if it works out that, in fact, you have moved. Um, there is a great deal of variation across the states about who registers, how do you register, how do you decide a dispute. So that's a little bit of how the sausage is made argument. No, everybody wants to vote, but nobody wants to see how the sausage is. First past the post says we use plurality. So what is a plurality? Number 52 most votes among all the candidates. So politely said, more votes than any of the other guys. What's a majority, by the way? More votes than all of the other guys combined. 
So plurality just means most votes among all candidates. So one of the things about voting in the United States is we've done a good job expanding the franchise. Franchise meaning who can vote. And we have uh, direct partisan elections. And I'll talk a little bit about voter turnout and some of the reforms. So at the beginning, you had to be, and we talked about that in, in class, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male landowners. And, you know, the property, the tax paying, the religion barriers that were in some states all dropped by about 1829, and that's part of the Andrew Jackson movement uh, in, in all but two states. The biggest ads have been African Americans with the 15th Amendment, but really the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then the 19th Amendment that um, allowed uh, women to vote in 1920, and then uh, young people, the 18 to 20 year olds, that got to vote in the 1972 election. So here we are at the polls, which are difficult to find. This is in Saline County, Missouri in 1824. And as you can tell by the picture, this is the good old boys club, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males only at the polls. So direct partisan elections, we, uh, <clears throat> we elect the president. That's been part of what we do, popular vote. Uh, the passage of the 12th Amendment, which was done after the election of 1800. Systems uh, generally guarantee a directly elected president, but there have been uh, multiple times, uh, most recently 2016, where the person who got the most votes didn't necessarily win the election. And then the 17th Amendment in 1913, which permitted the direct election of U.S. senators as opposed to being chosen by their state legislature. Some barriers to low voter turnout uh, and number 59, which is what is the most and least important factors to turn out. So I'll talk a little bit about this one. Uh, the one that is most connected to voter turnout is age. And then the one least connected to voter turnout, I would say, would be gender. So um, proportionally fewer Americans vote today than during the 19th century. We had a real high and now it's a little bit less. And a lot of that has to do with reg registration requirements, election day timing, and just the complexity of the ballot. So here's the data showing you that uh, the turnout for presidential elections has uh, peaked in the 1800s. It's now stabilized somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. So we've done some proposals to help people vote, hoping to get more people to the polls. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, here's one here. This is the Motor Voter Registration Law of 1993. And motor voter registration uh, lets you, when you go to do a government function, in this case, your driver's license, you can then register to vote. And I can remember when these were in two different offices in two different places, and it certainly made it easier uh, the different times that I've moved. So we're going to talk a little bit about who votes and the different groups. And I've already talked about the study guide question here. Uh, if you are in a higher income bracket and have more years of education, you are going to vote more. Now, is it one or is it the other? It's hard to tell. Some people say it's a combination of the both, but this is one of the leading indicators of people voting. And it's indicated here with, uh, you can see the table, and I would note age. See the 65 to 74 year old at 61%. So age is really the, the biggest connector when you look at 18 to 24 year olds voting at 17%. Race and ethnicity, nearly equal numbers of African Americans and whites vote. The gaps between them, again, connected to income and education. Uh, Hispanic voter turnout had been low, but it has been increasing, and that group is growing faster. So there'll be a larger and larger influence in electoral politics. And interesting, Asian Americans, smaller percentage, also have had a lower voter turnout. Age, and again, that's the most important factor for those 65 and above versus those 25 and below. Um, and, you know, why for youth? Well, maybe they're not necessarily connected to the process, didn't, weren't in a family that voted. They're not in the habit of voting yet. Uh, they're juggling work and school. You know, I voted absentee at the beginning part of my life almost every time. So here's mobilizing the young vote. This is college Democrats at Boston University in 2008 registering people for Barack Obama. 
Uh, and so college campuses, we are uh, the place where you can register to vote. By law, we are a voting registration hub. So gender, so this is the one on the far end of the extreme. There is no gap. Uh, women fought hard to get the right to vote in the 1920s, and there was a gap, and that gap disappeared in the 80s. So we've made great progress in that area. Uh, do policy preferences of non-voters differ, and how do their demographics differ? Since people that don't vote, we know probably uh, more uh, socioeconomic status, probably a little different. Um, but if they all voted, would we get different policy? Yeah, not quite sure. So let's turn to the presidential campaign in the final part of this partic particular uh, chapter. So this is preparing to run the primary, the general election, and then money in general elections. So who runs? Obviously, to run for president, even a senator, you know, uh, tends to be older, wealthier white men. They've been governors, senators, or maybe vice presidents. Uh, occasionally, you have someone like Trump or Jimmy Carter, who is seen more of an outsider to the system. Uh, you usually have to start two to three years out with some type of committee, and you're fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. You have to raise, uh, when, when you're getting into the campaign, you have to raise at least a million dollars a day uh, as a presidential candidate. So here's Trump kind of rallying support. Uh, this was his uh, Make America Great Again hat. He would, uh, he would, uh, do these at a regular basis. And I was looking today at some Trump bucks, million dollars, uh, by, signed by the future president of the United States. So the presidential primary system, um, and we'll, we'll look at that first. And, and the key here is number 51. Um, so what does the primary process do to affect candidate position issues? And what happens is when the Democrats and Republicans have their primary process, it pushes candidates to the extreme of their parties, and then they hope to win that process and then rush to the middle and get the votes of the central, the core uh, American voter. But the primary system in this country tends to push candidates to extremes. So here is Clinton and Bernie Sanders kind of debating. And uh, inter interesting debate, I think Bernie uh, was neck and neck with Clinton, and it was really the path of the superdelegate model that really helped put Clinton over the top in the 2016 race. So when do elections happen, number 54? When do presidential elections occur? Well, you always say, oh, they happen in that Tuesday in November. Well, it's the first Tuesday after the first Monday. So the Tuesday can't be the first uh, it would be the 8th. So when do elections happen? First Tuesday after the first Monday in October. And then in terms of actuating the campaign, uh, candidates really focus in on battleground states, states where there are uh, members of both parties and trying to win those states. There are seven or eight key states the candidates spend a lot of time in. And typically, Ohio is one of those states. 53, television advertising. What is the content of most Televised political ads today, well, no surprise if you watch any of them, and looking at the ones we're seeing right now, those would be negative attack ads, negative attack ads. And frankly, people are very tired of those ads. And the other is micro-targeting, where you go after very specific people using techniques like geofencing and texting campaigns. So how do you inform the voters? Uh, looking at typically the personal characteristic of the candidate, looking at past performance, you know, becomes literally a brand and a package of the candidate. So here's the public face of a party convention on the left, the famous 1968 Democratic Convention, where there was a huge stop the war movement that got uh, actually very violent out in the streets of Chicago. And then the Reagan Bush 1984 in Dallas, Texas, a very polished political show. And so this can be, uh, this can go smooth or this can go rough. So money, and this is a big issue in uh, general elections, hard and soft money. So hard money is that money which is uh, electorally very regulated. Uh, for example, uh, there's a $2,700 limit per person or per organization. Soft money is money that is unlimited and can be used for many things. Some candidates like Ross Perot, self-funded. Political action committees are groups that collect money for a candidate. Political parties often put money 
into particular candidate races strategically to keep their party in power. Right now, uh, parties are throwing monies in because we're in a mid-year election and the, uh, the Senate is at stake. And then number 57, outside groups. So what are 501 and 527 groups? So these are groups that have happened in relatively recent time, along with the super PACs. And these are groups that try to influence elections that have no contribution limit. So millions and millions of dollars kind of going into that. And they are issue oriented. So their job is to educate you on an issue, but their real job is to get you to vote for the candidate behind that issue. So here's the growth of hard money, particularly since the Supreme Court kind of took the cap off of it in one of the uh, pres presidential campaign decisions. And you can see the money jumped in eight and 12. So here's the limit I mentioned before, $2,700 per individual, uh, you know, 2,000 per committee, 5,000 per pack. So you can, you can donate as one of three or four or five different ways, but typically there are hard limits on money and very regulated. This is getting swift boarded, and we'll look about this in class. If you can look at the book, Unfit for Command, that's a book on John Kerry. And this was at one of the first 527 groups of uh, called Swift Boat Veterans that accused uh, John Kerry running for president in 2004 that he lied about his military background. And it was a pretty dark negative campaign, and we'll play some of those commercials. And here's Stephen Colbert in 2012, creating his own super PAC to make fun of the campaign finance system. And he was, uh, he collected, by the way, over a million dollars making fun of the campaign system, letting you know what it is like. The Supreme Court has weighed in on this. And remember I said, since the 50s, the Supreme Court has been pro-business. And this is one of the examples. The Citizens United decision which says basically there are no limits on campaign money that is used to uh, help a candidate win or for education. And so many countries move to public funding to try to limit this. We do have some public funding, uh, particularly for presidential elections, but you have to reach certain minimums and third party candidates were very good. And so does money talk? Well, at least money gets attention, I think would be a good way to say it in our world. So how voters decide and the Electoral College and number 55, who actually votes to select the president? And we know that answer is the Electoral College. Uh, 535 people that get to go to Washington, D.C. They cast their individual ballot. They represent different, uh, they are electors representing from their state, uh, depending upon who won, winner take all. So how do voters decide? Well, they look at the social characteristics of the person, they look at the loyalty of the party, and then they look at issues typically in a retrospective way. That's, that's usually the voting model for the president. And here's uh, president by groups and, you know, the red and the blue, Clinton versus Trump. Uh, and you can see where the red is a little bit bigger in certain areas, and then the blue is a little bit bigger in others, and I won't break it all down, but it was a fairly even election if you look at how these... Uh, different groups go. So Electoral College, winner take all in all but two states, Maine and Nebraska, and I'll talk more about that in class. So the features are the Electoral College is uh, the president can win the Electoral College, become president, but not get the most votes. That, that's happened in this last election. Uh, this uh, small states have more influence in some ways because you have to visit them to, for their electoral votes. But the big thing is number 58. What is the impact of the Electoral College on the American electoral system? Well, this absolutely prevents third parties from getting any meaningful traction. Uh, we're in uh, another country where a parliamentary system where someone with three to five percent of the vote might hold just a few seats in a parliament and be very powerful because those few seats mean the difference between governing and not governing. Here, you have to win a state to get any electoral votes. So third party candidates uh, like Ross Perot and third party candidates like uh, Ralph Nader win three, five percent of the vote, but but don't win any state. So they're basically shut out of the process. And by the way, shut out of any public funding the next time the process comes around. The biggest Bush v. Gore 2000, where Gore had the popular vote, but Bush won the electoral vote, hotly contested. Uh, Florida was the state that was the hotly contested state that brought this Supreme Court suit. 
And so what characteristic of American voting did the Bush-Gore Supreme Court decision reveal? And I talked about it earlier in the lecture. It is that the United States uses inconsistent election procedures and vote counting techniques, that the United States uses inconsistent election procedures and vote counting techniques. Different states do it different ways, even though it's a national election. Uh, so electoral college reform, and I've uh, lectured on this, spoken on television about this. There are different ways we can go. One is just abolish the electoral college, which I don't think will happen because it's rooted in the Constitution, uh, but maybe remove the winner take all. So if candidates got a proportion of the electors based upon the proportion of their vote, that would align it up a lot more with the general election, of, of which then uh, both Al Gore and Hillary Clinton would have been presidents, and, and Andrew Jackson and a few other people as well. So here is some of the election results. And so in 1980, where you see Ronald Reagan uh, receiving you know 10 percent more of the popular vote and won almost all of the electoral votes, and I'll talk a little bit about it in that particular election in class sometime. And then you have Clinton uh, clearly winning. Uh, you know, you have Bush uh, getting 37 and Dole getting 41, uh, but Clinton getting 43 and 49. But see that Ross Perot in there getting some of that vote, 8% uh, in one, 19% in another. So that third party candidate does affect it in some ways, but didn't win any electoral votes. And here we are in the most recent ones where. Uh, you know, the, uh, the popular election in 2016, extremely close. So the interactive exercise is going to be a little bit about the elections in Ohio. So that covers, this was a, a pretty meaty chapter. It had a lot of things attached to it. And I think I've covered all of the uh, chapter 10 voting items, if not, <clears throat> or study guide items. If not, we'll get to those in class. And we'll pick up here at the interactive exercise when we get together next. Thanks, guys.